Hi everyone, and welcome to the Civic Labs Information Challenge, uh, Information Session, I should say, for the Transport Access Challenge. Um, my name is Mark. I'm going to be your host today, helping guide us through. I will be joined by uh, Daniel from DTP. I'll give him an intro in a second. Uh, but I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. Uh, I'm beaming in from Richmond, which is the land of the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation. This is and always will be Aboriginal land, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, um, and also extend that acknowledgement and welcome to any First Nations people joining here today. Um, awesome, alrighty. So as I've said, my name is Mark. I'm the Startup Programs Manager here at Launch Vic. Um, I'm gonna be joined by Daniel, who is the Director of Transport Strategy and Research for the Department of Transport and Planning. And we're here to talk all about the Transport Access Challenge, which you're going to hear about more. Um, so just for a quick overview of today's session, uh, the I'm going to be starting off with a overview of Civic Labs generally, just to give you a bit of a brief idea. Um, I'll then be passing over to Daniel to give a bit more context and background around the challenge statement, and he can talk to that. Um, he'll then pass back over to me uh, to talk a bit more about the details of Civic, which is going to encompass the application process and uh, what kind of solutions we're looking for uh, before we have a Q&A at the end. Um, those first three points, hopefully Daniel and I can speed through those reasonably quickly so that we can get stuck into the Q&As. I'm sure everyone has plenty of questions to ask. Um, speaking of Q&A, uh, please do feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the call if you ever have any questions. Um, I'm pretty new to Zoom webinars. Uh, I somehow managed to miss them all during the last few years. Uh, but I didn't realize actually that there's two different functionalities. There's a chat and a Q&A. Um, so the Q&A is the one with the two speech bubbles. Uh, the chat is the one with a single speech bubble. Please use the Q&A, that's two speech bubbles, to answer and ask any of your questions. That way we can address those throughout the call or at the Q&A section. Uh, the chat function is purely if you want to have a chat with anyone else who's on the call. If you see someone you know, feel free to say hi. Um, but yeah, please do use that Q&A function if you have any questions about the program. Uh, as I've said, the LaunchVic team are live in the chat and ready to assist. Um, so feel free to say hello to them. Uh, and then finally, this session will be recorded and published on the Civic Labs website. Uh, so if you do miss anything, you need to go back over anything, or you just want to send this on to someone who you think might be interested, uh, please feel free to do so as this will be recorded. Excellent. Alrighty, I'm going to start off now with my general overview of Civic. Um, so what is Civic for those who uh, have never heard of it before, which is completely understandable. Um, Civic Labs is a six week program that connects startups and the public sector to help solve real world challenges identified by government. Um, we've been doing this for quite a few years now, and it's really an exciting opportunity to, to help new and emerging startups with potential solutions connect with relevant government departments and challenge owners. So for context over the last couple of years, uh, including this challenge, we've been working with the Department of Transport and Planning. Uh, we've done a couple of challenges with Vic Health. Uh, we've done a challenge with the Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. And each of those challenges will have a different sort of function or a different, uh, different challenge question. So it's really exciting to be able to work with all these different government challenge partners. Um, and, and what that process allows us to do is actually facilitate this agile co-design process between the public and the private sectors, because uh, there's not often always as many opportunities as we'd like for, for startups to work with government. So this is a rare opportunity where you can leverage the expertise and insights of our government challenge partners to help build your solutions. So it's really exciting. Hopefully everyone's excited as I am. Um, in addition to all that, uh, unlike other programs where you may have to pay to participate, Civic is in the fortunate position to actually fund startups who participate in the program. Uh, so each of the 10 startups who are selected to participate in the program will receive $15,000 worth of funding to refine their solution over the six week challenge. Um, and each of those 10 has the potential to be one of two startups that receives a further, further $35,000 in funding. Um, which will be paid post the program to help develop that solution further at the end. Um, I should also note all funding provided through Civic Labs is equity free. Um, we want to support and catalyze startup growth. So we actually don't take any early stage equity. So it's just a great opportunity to get that cash injection 
uh, to hopefully build out your solution nice and quickly. Excellent. Uh, all righty. I've just done that very quick overview. If anyone has any questions about uh, Civic Labs generally, feel free to start chucking those in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to hand over to Daniel now. So Daniel, feel free to flick your camera on and come onto screen. Um, very exciting to have Daniel here to be, to be talking about the challenge. Hello, Daniel. Uh, where are you beaming in from today, Daniel? I know we've got a few people in from Bendigo, from Melbourne CBD. Whereabouts are you? I'm currently uh, at Melbourne CBD, so the land of the Orundri people, of course. Thank you, Mark. It's wonderful to be here. Excellent. No worries. Thank you very much. I will hand over to you to start talking through the challenge statement. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, everyone, for Zooming in today. Um, on behalf of DTP, we're really excited to be partnering with Civic Labs on this transport access challenge. Um, there is a core principle that underpins the challenge, and I think yeah, it's on the screen now. So if we can improve access to the public transport network for people with a disability, then we improve access for everyone. It's probably simpler than it sounds, um, or harder than it sounds, I should say. Uh, so as a department, we're committed to creating a, you know, an inclusive and accessible transport system for all Victorians. We want to ensure that people of all kinds of abilities can travel confidently and comfortably on the network. Um, obviously, that's been a challenge uh, for various reasons, most notably that one in five Victorians do um, have a disability, either permanently or temporarily. That's around 1.1 million people. And as noted on the slide here, um, that covers people with blind or low vision, deaf or hard of hearing, mobility or physical disability, and noting that these can often be, be temporary and or um, neurological, neurodevelopmental or psychological disabilities. Accessibility is therefore see, critical to ensuring that the Victorian transport system is inclusive and, and equitable and the passengers can use the system in a dignified and independent manner. So <clears throat> to this end, um, we partnered with, um, with a research organisation last year to undertake extensive research into the customer journeys of people with a disability uh, that included, as you can see here, 60 ride-alongs. Um, the research covered all public transport modes, including regional services, and covered all phases of the public transport journey from, from planning the trip, to travelling to the station or stop, arriving at the station or stop, waiting for the service, travelling on board, alighting and interchanging, and post-trip. Um, and I'm mentioning that kind of detail to reiterate the holistic view of the customer journey that this challenge needs to consider. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll share some of the key significant findings of the research. I'll believe on the next slide. So yeah, um, travel for those with, with an, um, an accessibility, with accessibility needs can attract high time, uh, high time and cost penalties. Um, so the question then for us is how can we lessen the time burden on people with access needs as they travel on um, public transport? The research also showed uh, where those pain points are, uh, the real stress, anxiety and pain points on the network when real life interaction with services, stops, stations and infrastructure come into play. Um, so how can we ensure a seamless and consistent experience where information is accurate, dynamic and real time, especially during disruptions, either planned or, or unplanned? Um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, the research also reiterated what we unfortunately already knew, that the many people with accessibility needs actively travel, uh, sorry, actively restrict their use of the public transport system. Uh, when using public transport, people with, from all accessibility cohorts reported that they can experience significant sensory overwhelm. Crowded, busy, loud environments can make processing information and maintaining comfort even more difficult for those passengers managing additional access needs or conditions. So for this reason, many travel try to travel off peak wherever possible. And even then, most people involved in the research only undertake familiar routine or low complexity trips, even if they're less convenient or take more time or involve higher costs, such as the use of a taxi or a, a ride share. So the transport access challenge asks the question, how might we use technology to ensure that all passengers have fair and equitable access to public transport. That's the challenge statement for this transport access challenge. Um, as noted here, the question is deliberately broad and, and high level. We don't want to be overly prescriptive on the solutions that you might find. Um, fundamentally, we want to see, find and hear new ideas. Um, I want to hear and the department wants to hear. I'm sure Civic Labs wants to hear things that we might not have thought of ourselves. Um, so uh, we obviously, and finally, and this is probably the key point, one of the key points to really keep in mind, this is all about real world impacts as well. So we want to create uh, uh, create a real life impact towards equity for public transport users across Victoria. Uh, for the successful for the successful startup, um, you know, that'll um, be something that'll be for, for users, as I said, across Victoria, and maybe something that can even have a global impact as well. 
So thank you, um, Mark, I'll hand back to you and I'm looking forward to participating in the Q and A's because that's where the real work will be done. I think in this, uh, this over the Definitely. next 50 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. No, thank you so much, Daniel, um, for that quick outline. Yes. So, uh, thank you. That's, that's awesome. Really great context. Um, and yes, I can see some questions coming into the Q and A already. So feel free to start putting those in. We will address those in the Q and A section right at the end. Um, but for me, I'm just going to quickly go through a few more of the program details. Um, most of these will be able to be found in the program guidelines, which if you haven't checked those out on the Civic Labs website, please do so. They are a great source of information. Um, but I'm just going to go through in a bit more detail what we're looking for in the program and what that process looks like. Um, so in terms of solutions that we're looking for, we're looking for solutions that focus on improving access to public transport for all passengers traveling on the network, as Daniel kind of alluded to. Um, so this challenge, as I've said, is an opportunity to, for aspiring founders to co-design a solution with diverse accessibility challenges in mind and in turn improve the passenger experience for all public transport users. Again, to Daniel's earlier point, improving the network for these user groups will also improve it for all passengers and that's kind of our aim here. So an example of a few solutions that we're looking for, again, these can be found in the program guidelines, but for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to read yet, these are not the only solutions we'll be looking for. These are purely thought starters to hopefully get you an idea of the types of solutions that we're looking for. But if you're unsure or have any questions, as I say, chuck them in the Q&A. Um, so ensuring that all passengers feel safe and confident to use all forms of public transport, improving communication between passengers and public transport staff, um, if you attended our our launch event last week, you would have heard a really fascinating insight by um, people with that lived experience around communication uh, between the public transport staff and passengers being a real barrier, um, providing consistent, accurate and equitable access to public transport information. That can be a really key differential between being able to actually access it and knowing that whether you can access it or not is, is two big pieces where it can be, be a bit of a gap. Um, capturing feedback and improving data insights that enable development of multimodal transport precincts. Um, so there is a piece to maybe one part of the journey is very accessible, maybe then having to connect at a certain stage is not so accessible. Uh, improving the experience for users of the public transport network and multimodal transport precincts with hardware or software solutions. Um, so often we talk about technology and people will only think about software as a service solutions or, or apps or anything like that. Um, there is definitely uh, avenues for hardware in this in this um, program, as long as those hardware solutions have a scalable potential. So we can talk a bit more about that a little bit later. Uh, and then generally any product that, uh, any technology product that enhances the overall experience of public transport usage. That's really what we're looking for in this program. Now what to expect from the actual program itself. Um, as I've already mentioned, there is that initial, there's that funding that participants will receive. There's the connections into government, but we will also cover over the six weeks, a number of topics uh, in, in sort of learning formats, uh, whether that's panel discussions, uh, meeting with uh, transport experts or startup experts, um, or just content delivery from myself and my co-facilitator, Sangeeta, who uh, we too will be running this program. Uh, so topics for, for those kind of content sessions particularly will focus on problem statement formulation, value proposition, customer insights, prototyping, pitching practice, and then most importantly, those mentoring sessions with startup and industry vertical experts. Um, that's where the real magic happens, where you get the access to people that maybe you wouldn't normally get access to, but there is definitely great benefit in those learning modules that we provide throughout the program as well. Um, so in, in kind of giving that insight as well, that might give an idea of what types of startups we're looking for in terms of stage. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but that just gives an insight into the types of topics that we typically cover. Although we do custom design every civic labs program to match the needs of the participants. So, uh, we, we try to be as adaptable and flexible to our participants as possible to benefit them. Okay, so what's the actual process for selection in this program? Here's some key things. Um, so first of all, you've got to submit an expression of interest. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, you then will have to submit an application. There's a written and video aspect to that. Um, there is then a shortlisting process where we'll shortlist a number of startups for an interview. Um, that interview will be 15 minutes over Zoom. Very, very easy to do. 
Um, and then hopefully if all goes well uh, in that interview, you'll be selected for the program. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these stages just to make sure everyone's up to speed. Alrighty, uh, the expression of interest form. If you haven't already, please do so fill that out on our website. Um, it's designed to be purposefully quick and easy to do um, because it is compulsory to fill an EOI as part of the application process. Essentially, we like to open up the funnel nice and wide, allow everyone who has a inclined interest into the challenge, into the program. Um, so we make it really easy to, for you to submit your expression of interest. And then from there, everyone who fills out an EOI will be invited to submit a formal application. Um, so please, please, if you have any interest in this program, I would hate for anyone to miss out uh, just because they haven't filled out an EOI. You might have a great idea, but you might have just missed this key detail. Please do make sure you jump on our website and fill out that expression of interest form. Um, I should note there is a section in there around 25 or less, uh, 25 words or less. Please describe your idea or solution related to the challenge. This will not be formally assessed as part of the assessment process. It's more of just us getting an understanding of what, how many startups are looking at solving maybe a uh, specific solution, uh, whether there's uh, scope for that solution. Uh, it, it, but it's just a bit of an insight for us, more so than uh, an actual assessable field. So as much as we would love for you to put your best work forward and, and put a great solution in there, please don't stress too much if you uh, feel like you didn't get your best work out there. Uh, that won't be formally assessed as part of the application process. Um, but those EOIs close at 1 p.m. Uh, on the 27th of February. So we've got just about a week. Um, so yeah, please do make sure you jump onto that ASAP. In terms of the application form, uh, there's actually gonna be two sections to the application form. Uh, if you've ever been interested in Civic Lab previously, uh, this is slightly different as this is a new process that we've put in. Um, so part of the application will be a written application through Smarty Grants. Uh, this is kind of an example of what it will look like. Um, pretty standard stuff, we'll ask some questions in there. I'll talk about what those questions might focus on in a second. Um, the second part is uh, a platform called HireFlix, uh, where we will ask a number of questions, probably two to three, not too many, uh, and you'll actually be asked to create a video response. Um, that video response, you actually are given a limited amount of time to come up with that. It's meant to be in lieu of us being able to talk to you for longer, uh, over a video interview, for example, uh, without having to have the time constraints of, of talking to every single applicant for that extended amount of time. As I say, there is a proper formal uh, video interview a bit later, but this is our chance to get to know you in a way that's different from written text so that we can give everyone the best chance to put their best foot forward. Um, as I've said, all respondents who complete an EOI will be invited to apply by email address provided in that EOI form, so make sure you get all those details right. Um, the application will be looking at two main things, one being eligibility. Um, these are all outlined in the uh, guidelines, which is probably the best place to read all those. Otherwise, I may misquote something. Uh, but the eligibility criteria are being Victorian-based, uh, being a startup, which is a technology business. Uh, and you can read more about our definition there, either on the guidelines or on the LaunchGrid website. Um, idea or early stage, this is one thing I will spend a little bit more time on. The Civic Labs program, as I say, we always adapt the program to be best fit for the potential applicants. Um, so the idea to early stage, we outline as being uh, either you've just come up with this idea on the back of a napkin and you're really excited about it up to early stage kind of being, okay, maybe you've got one customer, maybe you've just got a product, um, but you're not really consistently built something. Um, there is avenue for companies who maybe are doing one thing and want to extend their their kind of product offering or product line uh, to, to kind of open that opportunity up a little bit. Um, but we'll try to be as transparent as possible throughout the whole process of who's a good fit for this program because we always want to be building to benefit the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem as much as possible. And if you've ever been through a program like this or any other kind of learning opportunity, it's best when the learning is genuinely fit to where you need it or how you need it delivered. Um, so we will try to be as transparent in that process as possible, but I will say there's probably slightly more avenue for a, for a later stage company if this was something uh, new they were developing as part of their offering. But uh, happy to answer any more questions about that a little bit later. Uh, one of the other eligibility is program participation. You need to be able to commit to participating every day in the program. Um, that's pretty easy. 
um, and adheres to the Victorian government policy on ESG prohibited activities. Again, check out the guidelines, they'll outline all of that kind of stuff there. Uh, in terms of the actual selection criteria, so as long as you meet all those eligibility criteria, you'll be judged on four selection criteria, action and alignment, impact, the applicant's capability and capacity uh, to participate in the program, and a launch pick assessment of support. Again, the program guidelines outline these much better than I will be able to, uh, but essentially we're looking at how well your solution is connected to the problem at hand, how much potential impact you could have on the problem or the challenge at hand, um, the capability and capacity of the founders themselves to be able to deliver this or, or participate in this program, uh, and then our assessment of support. And this kind of comes into that idea of, is this program actually going to support you for the stage you're at? If you were at a stage that maybe we define as too late to participate in the program, we may think that our assessment of support that we can deliver is low, and that might be something that scores you low in this selection criteria, just to give you a bit of insight. Uh, once you've done all that, hopefully you're all successful, you get selected for an interview. Uh, this will be about 15 minutes and it's used to better understand you and your startup idea. Uh, selected for the startups who are selected for the program will be required to sign a contract agreement to participate. Um, we'll have orientation and program, program kickoff activities in late April. And then uh, the $15,000 equity free funding to each startup to participate is provided at the end of the program. And then finally, before we jump into the Q&A, uh, just to outline what the end of the program looks like. So I've already talked about how you get in, then you'll have this six weeks of design sprint where you'll be working with us and, and our various mentors and uh, experts uh, over that six weeks. We'll then have two pitches uh, at the end of the program, and this will factor into the judging for the $35,000 additional funding. Um, so we run a judged pitch, which is where you'll actually be judged. Uh, this is a closed door environment in a boardroom with three judges uh, where they will select two startups to receive the additional $35,000. This is based off of that pitch, but also some other judging criteria as well. Uh, we'll then have a couple of days later, a showcase pitch where we'll be actually celebrating the whole cohort's efforts and there won't be any kind of judging at that event. This event is solely designed to celebrate the efforts of everyone who's participated in the program. Uh, and we don't want to make it too competitive at that evening. Uh, so we really just make it about the showcase pitch. We won't announce the two startups who received the funding until after that event, so that everyone can come in and have a great time and, and really just come together and celebrate. Uh, excellent. Ah, and just before I do go through uh, into the Q&A, just some final timings, things to look out for. Again, this is all in the program guidelines to check out, but here's a quick timeline of how the program is going to be running. I think I've highlighted a few key ones here. Um, so expressions of interest closed 1 p.m. 27th of Feb, so make sure you know that date's there. Um, once you fill out your expression of interest, as I said, all applicants will be given access to that application form. Uh, the application form closes at 1 p.m. 13th of March. So you've got about two weeks there to fill out that application. There's a whole other th bunch of things that I've already talked about that happen in between there. And then the actual program itself start on the 1st of May and conclude by the 5th of June with those pitch events the following week afterwards. Excellent. All right, Daniel, I'm going to ask you to switch your camera back on so that we can uh, do the Q&A. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen as well. I feel like I've been talking for quite a while now. Um, oh, I can see there's a poll in the start, uh, uh, polls come out as well uh, up in the chat. If you can fill out that poll whenever you have a chance as well, that'd be fantastic. Um, but excellent. I'm, I'm very excited to start jumping into the Q&A. Um, our first question from Damien is that there's some really insightful research here. Is this available publicly, especially the ride along journey information? Um, Daniel, can I pass over to you? To answer yeah, that sure. Question? It's not currently public, but we would certainly, um, our intention would be to share at least a, a key version, a summarized version of the research with the shortlisted participants. Um, just yeah. for full disclosure, we'd need to run that by our internal comms team first, hence why I can't provide a definitive answer now, but certainly the intention would be to share um, that with the shortlisted participants. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much, Daniel. And we're going to do our best efforts to help communicate any information where we can. Um, so if you have any particular questions, feel free to ask us and we can we can see what we can do. Hopefully that's okay, Daniel, as well. Um, excellent. All right. Aaron has got a couple of questions. So I'm going to address those. Uh, first of all, who should we talk to in order to obtain information about accessing the data? Oh, I think we've talked about that already. But um, if you do want to just double check anything, 
feel free to reach out to me. Um, oh, I should put up, we've got a Civic Labs email uh, address that we'll chuck in the chat. Uh, please feel free to email that one, or I've got an office hours link uh, that you can book in for and have a have a chat with me to, to learn a bit more about the program. So feel free to do that there. Um, oh, there we go. I've already answered your next question, Aaron. What would be the best email and easiest approach to reaching out to them? That's easy. Um, I will make sure that you get those details, Aaron, either in the chat or after this call. Um, and what is a reasonable estimate for the hardware budget that we can allocate to our project? Um, as I've said, each startup who participates gets $15,000 to participate in the program. Um, depending on what you envisage that solution to be, I imagine there could be differing budgets. Um, yeah, that, that really will depend on what the solution you see as being, uh, yeah, how much budget you need to allocate to that. But again, if you have any further questions, happy to help answer those. Oh, Aaron, I can see you've got some more questions. I'm going to go to someone else just so we can mix it up a little bit. Um, Vincent, I've got a question. Are you looking for local government partners with the challenge? At the City of Kingston, we're currently conducting an accessibility audit for people with disabilities across the municipality. I can imagine there would be some interesting intersections with Civic Labs. Uh, Vincent, that's excellent. We'd love to talk to you. And yes, we will be working with various uh, local government partners we've been already speaking to, as well as our state government fellows at uh, Department of Transport. So uh, yes, we'd love to chat to you a little bit after this uh, and we can yeah work out how we can include you in the program. That's great. Uh, Jerry, how do we know if our EOI has been received? Um, you should have received an automatic email uh, once you've filled out that EOI. Um, if you haven't, please let us know. Uh, I can happily double check um, and, and make sure that that has come in. But yes, you should receive an automatic email. Um, and yes, can we get a replay of this as well to best prepare for the process? Yes, we'll have a recording of this going out after this call. So hopefully that should be nice and easy. Um, I'm going to jump back to our end questions now. Uh, could you please provide a further explanation? What is the current problem that exists? Um, yes, so there's quite a few challenges that were outlined in the research. Um, obviously, we're giving you a top level of some of the ones there. Um, Daniel, are there any that jump out to you particularly that you'd be interested to see uh, this, this challenge addressing any of those from the report that you can talk to? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think it's a, I mean, that's one of the fundamental questions here. Um, at the moment, uh, information between uh, the public transport network as a whole to passengers is quite siloed. Um, we have a range of different apps uh, on, on, on the market. Um, we have websites uh, and, you know, the, the, the flow of information at the moment is a bit, in, is a bit inconsistent. So um, DTP has been making some good inroads in recent times around consolidating our data um, and improving the provision of real-time data to passengers. Um, that's something that's going to happen over the course of the next couple of years. So it's, the timing isn't quite right in terms of some innovation challenge. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the question really really sums up the, the problem that we're trying to solve here. How do we get better information to passengers in real time um, uh, about, about the specific journeys and the specific needs that they have? So um, for instance, uh, the example of a vision impaired person um, who might be affected by disruption and they need to uh, have a very good mind mind map or mind memory of the journey that they do. A disruption means that they are now at a station that they're not familiar with. So uh, that's a, a maybe just one case study about how we can improve information um, to passengers to yeah. them move around. So totally. it's pretty broad, um, but um, okay, it's really one of the key challenges we're trying to address through this this challenge. Of course, yeah. And I think uh, Randa Zedan actually specified around improving communication between passengers and public transport staff. Um, there was a really great example uh, at the launch event where we had David Simmons, who's the director for inclusive travel at the Department of Transport and Planning. Um, he's, he's blind and so he's got that lived experience of traveling on the network with low vision or being blind. Uh, he had a great example of at his local bus stop in Ballarat. Um, every person who's blind needs to communicate with a bus driver to confirm this is the right bus and also to help them get onto the bus. Um, so he has to physically do that right now and hail every bus and ask them that question. This is made worse by the fact that unfortunately at Ballarat, the area where he has to stand to do this is actually not undercover. So when it can be cold and wet uh, he, in, in Ballarat in winter, he's having to stand out there and do this for, for quite some time. So the, the opportunity there might be to improve the ability for someone who's low vision or blind 
to be able to communicate with a bus uh, to be able to understand one is this the right bus and then two to actually inform that bus driver who's coming up to to be able to hopefully set themselves up to to allow that passenger on board so that might be just one opportunity but yeah that there's there's the kind of things that we've been finding in this research so far okay uh jay has asked a question on one hand we need to propose an idea for another stage solution during our application so i'm just reading these live so apologies if i look like i'm concentrating a little bit um So Jay's question essentially is around um, how do we provide a solution for what we want to do without uh, sort of removing the possibility for co-design later in the, pro the process? Uh, great question and, and glad that it came up. Um, what we often see in Civic, particularly working with very early stage startups, is that you need to be flexible to be able to pivot your idea, but we do want you to have some kind of belief or drive in what you're doing. So what you come into the program itself may be very different to what you come out with. You may be working on either a solution or a market or a, uh, yeah, even a problem potentially. Usually problem is the thing that if you understand that, that's the easiest thing to kind of stick to. And then you can change who you think is the best customer or the best what the best solution is for that. Um, we want to see that conviction and understanding that you're you're excited about solving this challenge and this problem um, and having a novel way to describe that is going to be a fundamental part of the application. Um, but we do want to make sure and we'll talk about this if you select it into the program, you need to be able to sort of break those walls down and think divergently right from the beginning so that you can actually take on the feedback and take on the insights that we can uh, harness for you in, in the program. Um, beyond beyond the pure programmatic standpoint, uh, da uh, Daniel, anything to add to that? Uh, no, you summed it up nicely. Other than maybe just to add, you know, the um, just to reiterate that you know the initial uh, pitch doesn't necessarily preclude or you know get you locked into a, a specific course of action. There's absolutely that flexibility to, as you said, Mark, yeah. along the way. And I would yeah, reiterate that co-design um, is is probably a fundamental aspect we'd need to consider. Uh, I've been working with the accessibility community here, but that probably is something totally. we'll down the track in this piece. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, the next question is around uh, what if the business is registered in another state that the co-founder is Victoria based? Um, that's quite a technical question and will really depend on the situation. Um, I might need to touch base with that person afterwards just to kind of finalize what that process looks like. Um, so if that, I know it's an anonymous attendee who's asked that question, if you could reach out to our civic email or reach out to me, um, this this won't preclude you from applying later down the track. We won't, get, we won't look at you in any different light. This is just purely uh, as LaunchVic. So for those who don't know, I didn't explain LaunchVic because it's our sort of parent brand, but uh, Civic Labs is run by LaunchVic with a state government agency for startups. Obviously with that and Department of Transport being the, the Victorian government entity, we have to be working with Victorian startups and benefiting the Victorian startup ecosystem. So um, we want to create and help those startups locally. Um, so yeah, with that question, if you can reach out to us that much, it be one we can answer there. Excellent, our next question. Uh, let me just read that one. Uh, do we need to have a separate business entity with ABM required? Um, there's no necessity to have an ABM, uh, ABM as part of the application process. Um, so we totally understand that you might not have an ABM yet. You might not have, uh, this might be just an idea you've had off the, uh, as I say, on a napkin. So it doesn't need to be uh, legitimized just yet. Uh, so you don't need an ABM, that's the quick answer. Is it fine for a startup to compromise with a single member? Great question, yes. Uh, early stage startups, we would say it's pretty common that we have a single founder. For those teams that are maybe a little bit larger or you've got a couple of other co-founders, we generally say the max number of people to participate in the program is three per team startup, however you want to describe it. Um, so if you do have more than three people, obviously you just may need to have those work out amongst yourselves who's going to actually be participating in the program. Um, but yeah, single single members completely fine. So yeah, no problem at all. Um, how will the funding be considered from a tax point of view? Um, yes, so in terms of generating an invoice, yes, we do ask all the startups to produce an invoice for that $15,000 worth of funding. Depending on your ABN or lack thereof, 
or your company structure or lack thereof. Um, there are various company uh, tax implications there. Um, we will help guide you through that process in the program. We actually usually have a section on how to set up your business and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll try to make sure that everyone understands that. But um, if you have any specific questions about that, happy to help answer those in an email. Uh, next question, uh, does safety of infrastructure, of, sorry, does safety infrastructure or transport network fit in this program? Um, Daniel, any thoughts there around safety for, for this? This one? Uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't preclude anything at this point, so long as it uh, there's a link to the the statement challenge. So, um, yeah, I mean, infrastructure type solutions are going to be challenging given the budget envelope that we have here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, again, be, be be keen to have a look at ideas, especially you know, again, don't want to be prescriptive here, but just saying this is a hypothetical or an example. We know that a large number of our tram fleet remains in, uh, unaccessible and will remain on the network for a number of years. Um, so, you know, innovative solutions around that is something that could be both the safety and accessibility yep. um, piece as well. Yeah, fantastic. And I will just say further to that, um, do make sure you check out the definition of a startup um, just to make sure you feel the solution could fit into there um, to make it scalable. That, that's one of the probably main barriers of an infrastructure type uh, idea. Uh, but again, happy to help with that one if you have any questions. Uh, question here, will we get access to internal data like APIs, schematics, et cetera, from transport agencies that are not publicly available for developing? Um, Daniel, I know we've been having some conversations about this and what we can provide. I'm not sure if we have a definitive answer just yet, but uh, can you give some insight into that? Uh, we'll provide as much as we can. <laughs> yeah, um, we, uh, we are, as I touched on earlier, we provide, we've um, made, add, not we, the data team that I sit alongside here at DTP, the made some great inroads in recent times around improving the quality of the data. Um, and the Victorian government, we do indeed have an open data policy. So uh, we'll be sharing as much as we can in terms of the technical detail, uh, probably not across that at the moment, but um, yeah, we'll be sharing stuff. Uh, we'll awesome. still notice though, and maybe get more of a definitive technical answer yeah. on the track. Yeah, and I should say, it's, it's sometimes difficult to outline what that data will be when we are not 100% sure of what the data needed is. So um, yeah, we'll be working with the participants in this program to try and bring in as much data as we can. And we've been talking with uh, Beyond Yourself, Daniel. Uh, I know we had some meetings with customer insights and customer data teams from the department and, and looking at how we can connect them into this program as well. So yes, uh, as a startup person, I'm definitely keen for as much data as we can get as possible. So very keen to do that. Uh, I think I've already answered that question. It was about ideation phase and not having registered a company yet. Uh, question here, what are the opportunities after the program ends? Do we have opportunities to continue building, getting funding and partner with transport agencies in the future? Great question. Um, as with all Civic Labs programs, uh, there is a ongoing relationship specifically with uh, LaunchVic uh, as the startup agency. We'll be here to help you. Uh, and on your, on those journeys. And then with the department specifically, uh, we will try to help facilitate those relationships where possible as well. Obviously it just depends on the expectations of that relationship and how often you can get uh, connected into them and what you're looking to do. Uh, but yes, there is a general expectation that we'll try and facilitate that relationship as much as possible so that you can continue to work on these solutions and, and work with the department where possible. Uh, Daniel, any further thoughts there? No, nothing further, thanks, Mark. Great, no worries. Um, question here from Gable, uh, Gabriel around access to the research. Again, I know this is gonna be really keen uh, to get. Um, as Daniel said, we're still working on a way that we can provide that, that information publicly, um, particularly for the participants who get into the program. That will be the, the probably the absolute minimum that we'll try to do. Um, because yeah, we do understand that it is gonna be really helpful in, in generating these solutions. Um, and then Gabriel's second question is, do we have access to department experts to support us through the challenge to make sure we're addressing the problem in the best way? Definitely, that's sort of the underpinning uh, core idea of Civic Labs is us to be able to connect the department with the startups um, so that the startups can leverage all those insights. So yeah, totally, we'll be making sure that there's plenty of crossover with the department and, uh, and making sure that we've got some relevant people there uh, with that. Uh, excellent. I I think the last question I've got here is, can we submit multiple ideas? Uh, that's a great question. I would say, 
I would try to focus more on the problem that you're trying to solve. If you're trying to solve multiple problems, there's nothing technically from stopping you from filling out multiple applications. You're more than welcome to. It may just be a little bit exhausting. Um, but ideally, we'd be just from a pure application uh, processing standpoint, we'd rather be fo fo focusing on a single idea or a single application, but there's nothing to specifically stop you. Um, and, and we totally understand, as I've kind of alluded to earlier, that people are going to be changing their ideas, iterating on those throughout the program. So um, yeah, you can always include a bit more context around, okay, we're looking at solving this problem. These are some of the ways we envisage to solve it. And you could outline a few different ideas there. Um, yeah, nothing technically to stop you, just trying to make it as, as easy to understand for us as possible. Excellent. Um, I believe that is all the questions in our Q and A. Um, I'll vamp for a couple of seconds to allow anyone to ask any final questions. I know that I think we've got a few extra, uh, notes and messages that have been put into the chat. There's stuff like our email address and all that kind of stuff in there. So, so please feel free to check that out. Um, I'll put it up on the screen as well so that everyone can see that just in case you haven't. Excellent. Um, otherwise, I will say thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, please do reach out to us if you have any further questions. EOI is open for another week. Um, so please do get those EOIs in ASAP. Um, and yeah, again, thank you so much for listening and uh, look forward to seeing those EOIs and eventual applications come through. Daniel, any final words from yourself? Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, no, not really, other than thanks to everyone for, for joining and really, really keen, like I said, to uh, hear about some things that we might not have thought about ourselves. That's uh, my my thing that I'm thinking about. That's what you're looking for. Excellent. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I will play us out with some music and uh, feel free to jump off from there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.